Good afternoon, everyone. Tractor Man 44 here. What I got behind me is one of my uh, one of the things I built about 20, 25 years ago or so. And in keeping with everything that's uh, that's that's about my channel, I try to build everything I can with material in hand, uh, you know, or you know, just scrap things off the job site. And this particular one here is no exception. Uh, part takeoff drive and stuff is off of some old farm equipment, you know, just auction bought farm equipment that was, you know, turned to salvage. Uh, all the, the shafts and belts and all that kind of stuff, pulleys, bearings, all that stuff is off of uh, used rooftop equipment, large capacity rooftop equipment that I salvaged out over the years. And then, of course, the compressor. Uh, the compressor was given to my brother and it had sat over at his house for a long time and I built this with another compressor. And that other compressor failed. Uh, it was a lot smaller capacity. And so he donated that to the cause, uh, which is why it's not red like everything else. But uh, the tanks, the tanks are all, all used tanks. The one in the back, it's, a, it's an 80-gallon tank also, but uh, it holds 900 pounds of sand, whether it's silica sand or, or a fine Merrimack, Merrimack sand, either one. Um, and this tank here is 80-gallon tank as well. I've never figured the CFM on the compressor. The compressor, uh, close as I can tell, has got uh, two four-inch bores. They pump first stage into the second stage, which is the third cylinder, uh, through an aftercooler and all that stuff, or whatever they call it, intercooler, I think. And uh, that produces the second stage much higher pressure. I got the pulleys set up for 960 RPM on the, on the, uh, the compressor here. And that's what RPM. I really need to get full lubrication uh, and, and all that. But I actually run it just a little bit less because I don't need that much capacity. The sandblaster does fine when I run less RPM. I started out sandblasting at 125 PSI, and I'd have to run it at 540 RPM at that point. But now I run it much lower, probably about six or 700 RPM there, and it does a really fine job. And I sandblasted roughly 80 pounds per square inch. That'll give you a back-end view of the uh, three-cylinder compressor there, complete with unloaders and the whole bit. The unloaders are set at 125 PSI. I've got safety relief valves well beyond the capacity of the compressor to produce air uh, throughout the circuit. I've got like four safety relief uh, pop-off devices in the circuit. Uh, here's the tank here. There used to be a big vacuum tank right here off of a pair of vacuum pumps. And of course, that's an air compressor tank up there I got out of a printing company that upgraded. The uh, yellow there, the yellow container, that, uh, that's got a regulator on it. You see that regulator goes to that, uh, that yellow hose. The yellow hose goes to a Klimco hood that supplies me air through this right here by a second regulator right here off of my uh, off of my belt. That yellow hose supplies uh, regulated air pressure to this right here which provides my my, my clean uh, charcoal filtered air to go inside to keep you cool and keep you from sweating and, and getting all tired. But uh, this Climco hood then has motorcycle style or motocross style uh, tear-offs and you stack up about five tear-off masks on it and it's got a glass shield behind it, but you just reach over here and peel one off when it gets frosty and you can't see very well, and then you're good to go again. But I usually stack about five on there, and I think that's the last one right there, so I'll be using a new one before too long. But uh, it's a very good, very good job. This is very expensive. When it comes to breathing, you want to take care of yourself, you know. By rights, you're supposed to have a, a special air compressor that is an oilless compressor. I am not recommending anybody build anything like this. Uh, and for all the naysayers out there that tell, that want to say and, and uh, kind of tell you how dangerous this is, yes, it is dangerous. There's no doubt about it. But you got to use just a little bit of sense about yourself. You know, when you build things, you just kind of have to build a certain degree of a certain level of safety in it, which is why, you know, I run it a little lower RPM. I don't have to worry about the excessive pressure. I've got the relief valves. Don't have to worry about excessive pressure. If I do have a pop-off, you know, the relief guys are going to take care of it because I've got them at different stages in case the one can't keep up and it continues to build pressure. The next one will pop at another 10 or 15 pounds higher. So I have very, very little chance. I've got redundancy in the circuit, so to speak. It's worked fine for me for all these years. I've sandblasted everything you can possibly imagine with it. The last thing we did was an entire tractor over at my brother's house. And I don't remember how many years ago or so that's been. Uh, don't bother telling me, you know, how stupid it is building something like this. A lot of people that have a lot of bad things to say about things that people build, like pick it apart because of safety issues and things like that, you know, you're not the guy up here using it. So um, I'm going to troll you before you get a chance to troll me. Uh, just blow it out your tailpipe, you know, and uh, just go and watch somebody else's video. Uh, this is um, uh, just kind of the way I do things, you know. I, I think of something, we build it, we use it, uh, and if it doesn't work, we make changes and work until it, uh, it comes to our satisfaction. Uh, most of the time we get kind of lucky, you know.
we got this end of a propane tank and we welded a coupling on the end of it to fit the, uh, the fill cap there. Just spin it in place and put in about 150 pounds of sand and it fills itself. And that red thing is 150 pounds or that's how much you're putting in? I'm putting 150 pounds, two 80 pound bags, 160 pounds of sand. It holds about two bags. The... Right here. Oh, the whole oh, tank oh, oh, holds I'm 900 sorry. 900 pounds. Gotcha. The whole tank holds 900 pounds. Holy crap. <laughs> on top of the. Oh, look at that. Look at it go down. Yeah, and see, that's what's happening inside the tank. And once it gets down so low, it comes right out the center and it quits delivering sand. That's when I had to shake it or blow it a little bit a minute ago. <laughs> Here we go. I'm obviously an adept cameraman. Camera woe man. When I first built it with the other compressor, I didn't have this, it just had a large funnel. Oh, and I would fill it with coffee can coffee cans out of the bag into this small funnel. No way. Oh, yeah. oh that sounds terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. It was terrible. Sorry, this tractor man people. I'm trying to make it nice and not shaky, but my arm can't do it. <laughs> I have my daughter as a videographer today. <laughs> She's doing a fine job. When it quits going in, you have to back this off, reach down and level out the top because it'll be making a peak on the inside just like this valley right here. Right in here? Yeah. We'll spin it off right here, stick the, the conduit down in there and level that off because it's inside developing the exact same angle that this is. Here you go. Yes, I understand. Soil or rock or anything left on its own when dumped will automatically pull a uh, 45 degree angle all the way around. That's so cool. That's Mother Nature, man. I know, right? I feel like that has something to do with Fibonacci. With what? Fibonacci. I don't know. The largest silica sand mine in the uh, in the nation is my hometown. Have a time? No, silica. Silica. Well, duh. <laughs> Why would they name? Shut a, your face. A silica Delete sand mine. Delete this part. This is a obviously it's a <laughs> uh, blooper reel. <laughs> and this is my youngest daughter right here that was actually filming while we were filling the 900 pound reservoir full of silica sand. Two of these three projects for today uh, are actually for her, so she's getting getting her share of sandblasting in for sure. So here's one we finished already. You can see a little bit of flash rust there. There's so much humidity, and when it goes down to bare metal, it'll have a tendency to flash rust fairly quickly. But uh, she's going to use a rust oleum. And she'll probably just hit that real quick with a sand cloth and then go ahead and rust oleum primer right over the top of it. But you, so, uh, yeah, we're going to continue on. We've got several other, several more projects to, uh, to finish up for my daughter and then for the missus, of course. And uh, we're just going to keep on trucking, man. I'll give you all a little bit of a, a better overview. Now, you can see the monster compressor up on top. It's a three-cylinder, two-stage. Um, I know that it's going to be uh, in excess of a 100 CFM. I don't know exactly. I've never calculated it out, but I could do that. But if you can see, the discharge of the, uh, of the second stage comes out here in the inch and a half line and drops down into the top of the tank right over here on the left-hand side. And then, of course, I've got pressure gauges on the front so I can adjust everything from the, uh, from the tractor, the speed of the tractor, so I can see how rapidly it's filling the, the tank. And then also I've got a glycol-filled gauge here that I can monitor while I'm back here adjusting everything for the, the actual sandblaster. But then the, the pressure comes out of the tank and then goes over into this large standpipe right here. And at the bottom of that large standpipe, you have to look really close. You can see a tiny little brass petcock down at the bottom. That's so periodically I can, I can pop that petcock and blow, uh, blow droplets of water. I have to keep that water from the atmosphere being drawn into my sand. 
And so it uh, exits that, uh, that standpipe and comes over here into this T. The T is designed to go up into the top and pressurize the top of the tank where I put the cap on uh, in place of the, uh, the fill. Well, that's, that's the fill cap, of course. But that pressurizes the top of the, uh, the tank or the sand in the tank and at the same time comes down to the bottom and goes over. It disappears behind the frame but goes over into a cross. By cross, I mean it's a, it's a four-way T to where you have essentially piping that goes like this right here. The uh, sand has a ball valve. The top of the cross has a ball valve that you can adjust to uh, the, uh, the amount of sand that's dropping into the airstream, uh, the, uh, pressurized sand, so to speak. And at the same time, the air is adjusted right here. The quantity of air is adjusted here on the left side of the cross that blows out the right side of the cross, picking the sand up with it, and then onto my uh, sand blasting hose and then the ceramic nozzle. Um, periodically, because you know, whenever you put sand in, there's little impurities that gets in there, like pieces of paper from the sack and things like that. And uh, also, there's moisture in the atmosphere that does enter the sand, uh, no matter what you do. Because I don't have a, an air dryer of a capacity large enough to remove the air from the the amount of air that this compressor generates. So what happens is the sand will actually bridge because of that moisture and or the paper or other contaminants right at the top of that orifice. And so what I've got on the bottom of the T or the bottom of that cross is another ball valve that I can just rapidly pop open and close instantly. And what that'll do is that'll allow that pressure inside the tank to blow clear the debris that's blocking that inlet of the cross. And then your sand goes ahead and uh, starts coming back out of your uh, sandblasting hose again. The higher the humidity, the uh, more often you have to do that. But fortunately, as long as your sand is dry going in, that doesn't happen very, uh, very frequently. The actual frame is an old chiller frame off of a stacked set of carrier chillers that I tore out, my gosh, 30 years ago or more. Uh, and like I say, these pulleys, they're all, uh, that's all used equipment off of uh, air handling units and things like that I've torn out over the years. And of course, channel iron is just scrap off the job and everything like that. I do see something that I bought. I bought that uh, I bought that jack stand right there. But other than that, all the gauges are off of uh, demo jobs, demo projects. All the piping is scrap gas piping, scrap boiler piping, and everything like that. The uh, spindles on the wheels, uh, those are off of a John Deere hay bind. Incidentally, the same John Deere hay bind that donated the right angle drive, that's on my Kubota and the uh, buzzsaw. Here again, you can see the physical size of the uh, of the uh, compressor cylinders. The uh, two cylinders on the first stage obviously have air filtration, uh, and of course, those discharge of those two pump into the suction of the uh, the second stage. Here's a just an old a, a rim off of a ride lawn bore that uses a hose reel. You know, like I said, you know, we build stuff with things that we have in stock. Uh, and there's another thing that I had to buy. I I bought that charcoal filter. That charcoal filter is very, very important as far as I'm concerned. And I bought a brand new dedicated 50 foot um, uh, 3 8 hose, you know, for the uh, the Klimco uh, sandblasting hood. That provides that uh, that airflow across your face to keep it comfortable and everything inside there. Now you can tell it's uh, it's got some years on it because how everything's all rested up and everything, but it doesn't matter. A few drops of oil and I can go back to making my adjustments. But what I've done, I, I came up with this adjustment, uh, belt adjustment set up with these dual unit struts here and I built a slide inside here that the, the bearings, the pillow block bearings are bolted to and I can loosen up those and adjust this right here and then bring it this away whatever or this away or that away in order to align that and there's a similar setup on the other side that takes care of the pillow block bearings on the incoming uh, power takeoff power supply into this set of pulleys. Obviously, you can see the weakest part of the whole system is the um, is the uh, the pulley setup. Uh, we've tossed around the idea of coming up with a four-speed transmission and and gearing it. In other words, instead of having the belts that create heat and uh, and start slipping after seven or eight hours of sandblasting when it's 80 or 90 degrees, maybe even. And we've done this in 100 degree weather, and they do have a tendency to get a little bit warm. They'll stretch a little bit, and I have to continually tighten up. And you can see right now. I probably should change the belts right now because this one here is already stretched and turned what little bit we used it yesterday, but no big deal. I'm going to let her go till she blows, you know. I 
had to come over here with the uh, camera stuck behind the second face shield and sneak up and get a smile and a wave from the missus uh, because the sand is flying everywhere and I didn't want the camera lens to get pitted or get the mechanics of the camera gummed up with the uh, silica sand. Now right here we're only running about uh, about 75 pounds of air pressure and we're using a very small nozzle. When I use Merrimack sand and run it up to 100 or 125 pounds, every pass with the nozzle will remove about a one inch to an inch and an eighth inch wide strip of rust off of whatever material, uh, whatever surface you're hitting with the sand plaster. And of course here's three of the projects that you actually saw us uh, working on today. The two first ones are for my daughter, the yellow chairs for the missus. At any rate, you know what? This has been a fun afternoon. And um, this is Tractor Man 44, and I am out of here.